So yeah, just um, introduce yourself and we'll go from there. So go for it. Okay, hi. So my name is Roman Campos Herrera and I'm creative director on For Honor. All right, and you? And I'm uh, Damien Kiken, the game director on uh, For Honor. Yeah, first, first of all, thanks for, for inviting us over here. And uh, I know we, you guys had a presentation about For Honor a year later. There's been a lot of challenges for you guys. Um, but it, it seems like walking over here, it seems like your team has been uh, f focusing a lot on multiplayer side and fixing the bugs and everything. So why was it so important to, to work on those um, even after the game releases? Because usually companies will stop and you know, I'll continue working on the, like the next project, but it seems that you guys are really focused on, on working on this game still. So first, thank you for coming. All right. Yeah. And uh, the the plan with For Honor since the beginning, that's part of the DNA of the project. It's to be a game of service. It's to be a platform and it's to be something that is here for the long term. And all, that was the goal at first. And we released, we had really successful release, crazy open beta, really good first months, more than 7.5 million player after a year. So the game has been working well, but yes, we had some issues. But the goal was to fix those and continue and move forward and not just go, oh, okay, we made 7 million player, okay, let's wait for the next one. No, that was not the plan with the game and that was not also the, the promise and the commitment we made to the community. It's we want to keep pushing the quality of the game improving it, continuing to add new content. We had six new players during the first year. Currently, we are revamping the, the first uh, heroes that uh, the game shipped with, and most have to come. Yeah, another thing too is I noticed that you guys have been focusing a lot about fixing the issues, and I know you guys added the dedicated service and stuff, but do you see this also in the future maybe Adding as like an esports uh, type thing for, for this game because I can I can see the potential, in my opinion, you know. So because uh, like you said, the the fans are very very hardcore with this game and they're very competitive. But why not go to that route too, like esports? Thank you to to, to see that. Yeah, uh, it's it's uh, something we share. So since the beginning, Forno has always been thought as a competitive game, competitive first. Uh, I don't think as designers or as developers, you decide if your game is e-sport or not, but at least what you can design and what you can make is how competitive it is. And so this has always been our focus to make a competitive game. And that's why we focus so much, as Roman said, on balancing, on uh, revamping some of the old heroes. We also change some uh, core aspect of the fight mechanics. Mm -hmm. And we think we, we have to do all of that first before going bigger on that area. But in the meantime, of course, the community is already doing a lot of tournaments. We are watching tournaments every weekend. We have uh, tournaments organized by the community every weekend. So it, it will uh, grow at its own pace. Uh, but what we can say is that in our case, we're focused on delivering features, on improving the game so that it's the most competitive as it can be. Why was it so important for you guys to now start communicating a lot with like the the fans? Because uh, usually back back when I started, you know, podcasting like 13 years ago and stuff, a lot of the companies wouldn't, the developers wouldn't even bother talking to the community. They would probably browse the forums to see what they're saying. But it seems like the communication has been getting getting a lot better now with developers and the community. Why was it so important to make that change now for you guys? For me, the main difference. It's been with where the project is here for the long term. When we ship Forerunner, we continue to work on Forerunner. And because we continue to work on Forerunner, we need to stay up to date with the, the status, with the current status of the game, not only from our perspective of developer playing our own game and playing builds in the future, but also with the perspective of the player and try to improve the game for them. And the only way to be able to stay connected and know what to fix, what to improve, what people want, to actually have that discussion. And in order to have that discussion to be to work, you need to give visibility to the player. You need to tell them, hey, yes, okay, we, er we heard you on that. Yes, that is an issue. We're working on that. We want to fix that. Hey, we want to add that new mode, or we want to add that new type of feature. What do you think? So you need to have that discussion in order to move forward do what's best for the for the game. I know you. There's now what six seasons now. Um, so I, there's a couple that I missed. You know, and there's probably a lot of new gamers that 
probably will decide to buy the game later. And they want to p- try out those season that came out in the past, like the, the seasonal content. Are we going to see that back again in the future? Or, or are you guys going to focus on just adding straight up new content? So that's it. so. Of course, if you come now to For Honor, you will benefit from all the improvements we've made, all the new content we've added, the permanent content. Mm-hmm. Then, for on, on the seasonal side, we want it to be a time limited and an event in itself. We want people to come only for that in the game. So it doesn't mean we won't reintroduce some of those or some content of those. It's still something we're discussing internally because it's a request we get more and more. The, the more season we make, the more events we make, the more the community is asking us, hey, I'd like to see back those weapons, I'd like to be able to loot back those weapons, etc. Mm-hmm. So I, I think something we'll do in the future. We don't know the formula yet, uh, but really the, the, the intention for us is to say, okay, if you want to be part of the Rit of Champion event, for example, that is uh, playing right now in the game, well, you should come now and, and enjoy it now. Enjoy Carousel of Death. Enjoy this exclusive content. And this is to reward the players that are here at that moment. I know back then the business model was release the game, have a couple DLC content. Let's go to the next game. Why the way how Ubisoft been doing it now for like the past few years is adding a lot of content on the same game over and over again. Um, why why they change? You know, for someone from the outside, don't know much about that. But um, what, from the inside, tell us a yeah. little bit about that. It it really goes with the game as a service model. So as soon as you decide to be a game as a service model, it means that you know you will have a big team behind the game every month after it ships. So you need to find a business model where the the company is making enough money to sustain the team to be able so that the team can still work on the game and improve and improve it at content etc so it's a new business model to find so it's not only based on releasing a dlc etc but it's also based on releasing a cosmetic content and things like that and and in for honor we had really strong pillars since the beginning we wanted all content to be accessible to everybody so we knew we would have some players who want to support us, who want to invest more uh, into the game, and that's and that's great. It helped us work on it. And we knew we would have some players that would maybe have more time to spend on the game, but don't want to invest more into the game. And and we don't want one player to have more content than the other, etc. So so that's why all match make content, so new maps, new mode, all of that, it's always given for free. It's a good way. Uh, to retain players, it's a good way to tell them or keep continue working on the game. And then uh, uh, other part of content is either unlockable through play or unlockable uh, against money. And and we, we think we found the right balance so that everybody can enjoy the game, everybody can enjoy all the content, and at the same time it's sustainable for us so that we can keep working on, on the game and that's what we want in the end. And why doing that instead of saying, yeah, okay, so we ship for honor, or let's do uh, for honor 2, etc. It's because now as developers, at least, we want, personally, I want to grow my game with its population and continue to make it evolve and not necessarily every time restart from a, a blank, uh, blank page and go, oh, okay, no, I want, no. I want to continue to push my ID and see how far we can go with it, how much we can take out of it in terms of gameplay and continue to build that on the same population of player. And don't split regularly that population because I don't see any real interest today to split the population. And what has changed is now we have a pool of players for live games that is big enough for us to sustain that model. Whereas previously, you had to reacquire really often to keep that pool of player. Today, no, we can, because of the quality of the retention that we have on the game, can keep that pool of player and continue to, to kind of work with them in a way, in, in the sense of continuing to push content with them, continue to support the game and play, and play with them. And for me, that has been the shift. It's, okay, now we've built something, we can actually continue to improve and continue to build on it and not do something new and justify something new to add on it, etc. Just continue to work with that. A lot of gaming companies now are doing the whole uh, like cross play and stuff. Like I know it's it's not balanced when it comes to PC versus uh, like consoles, right? 
But I, I could see something like maybe getting together with a friend and playing against the AI, you know, uh, is that possible? Do you think we might see something like that in the future uh, based on feedback from the community, you know, having friends from PC and consoles together against like the AI? Stuff, so so it's think? it's not something we're planning for the moment because mm -hmm. of, of technical reason. Uh, as, uh, as you said, for example, we have a different frame rate on PC and console, mm -hmm. so it wouldn't make the, the, the thing compatible. Uh, we think cross-play is great because based on what Roman just said, it's making the community even bigger. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. in the end, uh, it's a very valuable direction, but it's not something easy to do and even less in the foreigner situation where we have a, a simulation. Uh, we have a tech that is very uh, um, exotic, I would say, to make a 4v4 fight possible. So, uh, well. But in foreigner, we have the... The faction law and the faction law is actually cross play. So all your match contribute to your faction, whether you're on PS4, Xbox, and the, and and PC. So we have that foundation. Now moving in the future, and yeah, I'm speaking about long term. Is it something that we're interested in for the brand and for the long term? Yes, definitely. But today, in terms of technology, on foreigner, we're not there yet. Now for those that. Are afraid to go to the multiplayer side and play, you know, against other players. They're more of like, I just want to play on my own and stuff. Do you have also content for for those, that type of crowd too? So the last month, yeah, um, in April, we uh, we released a whole new onboarding to the game. So a complete revamp of all the the tutorial experience with a uh, with a trial mechanic where we teach you all the skill against AI, etc. We released uh, a new system with an arena where you can test all your character in any situations against uh, any type of uh, behavior, etc. Again, in a safe in a safe environment. So we are pushing the the onboarding experience when you don't want to necessarily go directly in uh, in PvP. In, in the same thing, we've made some events like uh, for the anniversary of the first year of Honor, the Test Your Metal events, where you had a, a player versus AI game mode where you had a full team of player against a, a rhythm version of the of the boss of the campaign, etc. So we still want, and, and we have new stuff that we will announce later, but. It's something that we want to continue to push the player versus AI aspect in the game, and we want to continue to, to support that, but still inside the multiplayer, uh, a multiplayer environment. For Honor is a multiplayer game first, and this short term, we are not going to push the game again in a more single player or narrative direction. We want to keep the multiplayer aspect. Either it's against player or against AI, still it's in the multiplayer environment. I, oh, yeah, go for it. Just to complete, all modes are available against bots, and that's something that since the beginning we always wanted. You can play it in matchmaking or only with friends, and it's shared progression. So whatever you do against bots is, is going towards your progression in PvP. And now each time we introduce an event that is PvP, we we'll also make it available in, uh, against bots. So it's also something we know we have a part of the population that likes playing against bots and it's something we support. I, I know the past year you guys have been adding now with like 5,000 plus new content in the game and stuff. Um, was there any content that you guys thought, man, this is going to work out and people start playing it? Wasn't, maybe it wasn't all that based on, based on the feedback, but ba also based on the feedback, Will that also help you guys to come up with new ideas on, on the type of content that you guys can release in the future? You, usually, it's uh, it's more the reverse. We, we were like very impressed by the level of reception and stuff, stuff we haven't seen. So, yeah. so for example, th there are something that, that became now rules and that weren't rules before. So we're uh, so releasing uh, new executions. And we had some execution that ledges. So execution that when you kill your opponent, he, he he goes in the void and he doesn't go against a, a transparent wall. But not all executions were supporting that. And now it's a pattern. It's a, it's a, it's an ingredient. The players are asking for that. It's like, oh, your execution doesn't ledge. It sucks. It needs to ledge. And then the team is updating it, etc. So this is the type of feedback we get. Is how something that wasn't a parameter for us became something really core 
to a value of an execution, for example, to the player. Same thing for emotes that are spammable. Uh, the emotes that are spammable have way more value to the player than other emotes. And, and this is one of the, the things they look at. So yes, this is definitely part of uh, things we're learning uh, by uh, releasing those new content. That, that's cool. That's cool because, uh, you know, the other day I started uh, playing it again for Anika. It's been a while and stuff. But there were some modes that will say high activity, a lot of people playing. But there's some that's low activity. Based on that too, those stats, that also will help you to come up with new yeah. type of ideas to bring the, the gamers back. That was one thing that I was going to do to bounce on. It's, yeah. Yes, usually the weekly content and the customization content mm -hmm. has always been really successful in the game and really in demand by the player. The elements where we thought it would work better, it's when we release Tribute. So the 4v4 game mode that we release uh, November, October, uh, end, of, uh, end of last year. And because in terms of feedback of the player, the feedback has been really good. Like people love the game, et cetera. The issue with Tribute is that it's particularly good when you're playing with friends in a pre-made team against a pre-made team because it requires a high level of team coordination and, uh, and tactic. And so in matchmaking, it's less popular because it's not necessarily a game mode that you want to play with, uh, with randoms. So, and that was something that we knew could happen with the game mode, but not necessarily at, uh, at that level, for example. The other game modes that are less popular are the this match type of game mode. Uh, it's skirmish or uh, elimination, and same thing. We knew that at the foundation, for honor is more either a duel or a team objective based game. And so yes, this match team, this match type of modes are a little bit less popular. Still, there are a lot of players out there that just like the sheer chaos. Of, uh, of skirmish. Mm -hmm. So are we making it better? Yes, we release an update where now we change the respawn rules, for example, on, the, on skirmish, etc. But do we want necessarily all of our game mode to have the same level of attention, the same amount of player, etc.? No, I think it's okay to have game mode that are more popular, game mode that are, that are less popular, as long as you can play in each of, uh, of those. And when you start to have issues to play in a specific game mode because nobody's playing it, etc. That's where we want uh, to act. And so, for example, today we are looking, we are looking at uh, the way we're doing ranking and tournaments in order to solve this type of uh, issue of uh, queue time. I know you guys been adding a lot of characters too in the game uh, the past year. Balancing how that works um, based on the new characters, you think it was like a little bit too much for, for like too strong compete online with other players uh how you guys worked on that too because it could get really challenging too for you yeah. guys right so no we have a roster of uh, 18 characters that means that every time we have a character it's more complex and more complex every time we, we have a new character because it needs to be balanced in a way with everybody else in the in the roster but it's basically the balancing pipeline there is two different balancing that we're looking at there's the actual balancing Time of data, and that's more the end game balancing with the top 5% player, and that's based on win loss ratio and move usage, etc. And so that's how we create our tier list. And so when we are balancing that, for example, that's why we are doing reworks of old character or nerf of too powerful character. It's really based on the data of those top 5%. And we have workshop with those guys. We have private Discord, private uh, test version in order to uh, to iterate with uh, with our top five percent in terms of balancing. But there's also part of balancing that is based more on perception, play style, that is actually affecting most of the population. And that's what happened when you have the flavor of the month. So, oh, that character is definitely OP, and yeah, discussion. Oh no, you just dodge. It's easy, etc. This kind of thing. The issue here, it's more than balancing, it's perception and it's actually frustration. And that is linked to the play style of the character. So that's where we actually change some moves of characters, add new moves, new chains, or nerf move, etc. It's to address the frustration <clears throat> of fighting against or as that character and not necessarily the overall win-loss ratio of that specific uh, guy. I think one of the biggest moves you guys made was changing it to uh, dedicated servers. 
I, th- I think that helped a lot. Um, why they change? Why, why the, okay, that's, I think that was like a major, major, major big step. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a full story on its own, to be honest. Yeah. Uh, why? Because, because we weren't reaching the stability levels we wanted to reach. Uh, and uh, this was especially true in, uh, in 4v4 uh, matches. So dual was fine, brawler were fine, but 4v4 matches, we had stability issues. And one of the things we discovered post-launch is that with our meshed peer-to-peer model, if we had one player on the session that had a bad connectivity, he would impact negatively the session for everybody else, making uh, resyncs and things like that. And sometimes crashes of the session disconnections. So we improved a lot the peer-to-peer uh, model during months and months. And in, par- in parallel, the team, seeing the rate of improvement and how we, we were moving the stability up, uh, the team decided to change the, ar- the architecture at the same time. So we knew it would be a huge work, many, many months, eight months of work uh, to change uh, the architecture. It's not something you do usually. You have to stick your, with your engine. You have to stick with your architecture. It's not something you change uh, and even more uh, when you're live. But we, we knew by doing an investigation, a study and all, that in the end it would be better for the game. And because the game is for the long term, as uh, Roman was saying it, because we are a game as a platform, because we wanted su- to support it for years, it, it made sense to invest money, to invest a lot of time into that change, into that uh, move to the dedicated server. So it's something we released a few months ago. The results are great. We have uh, no, uh, no session migration, no resyncs anymore. We um, removed uh, 75% of connectivity issues we had on peer-to-peer uh, and a lot of other benefits. So in the end, it was really a good move. It took us a lot of time, but in the end, we're very happy. And it's still something the, the team is working on and improving on right now. Well, I know we're going to have another interview later but um, from the next one. But uh, you want to guys give want to give a hint for those guys? I know you guys have been working on some E three stuff, right? Some E three announcements, and I seen it on the stream too. Uh, want to give a hint uh, to anybody, or they have to yeah. wait to the next episode? Or? I think we can give a quick hint. On yeah. there is something that has been requested by a lot of players for Ooh. a long time on forum that we might show at E three. Oh man, there you go, there you go. All right, <laughs> cool, cool. That, see, I, I think I like that that you guys been really interacting with with the fans and stuff. You know, a lot of a lot of companies they'll stay away and they just work on the product and that's it. But I think based on the feedback, I think it will help you guys also learn from the gamer point of view. And yes. for them, they'll know more about like the business point of view and development point of view too. So I think it, it works out for both of you guys, man. So. Yeah. But I just want to say thanks for the interview and uh, no can't wait. Thank you for coming. Can't wait for E3, man. Can't wait for the big announcement. So, man. Cool. Definitely. All right. Thanks, man. <laughs>